All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. To Martha, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Before we open the word of God together this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful we can come together to focus upon you this morning, to learn of you, to learn of how you have worked in history, to learn of how you have revealed yourself to us and how we are to live, and to come to understand the provisions that you have made in, in governing the human race through human government. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand the principles laid down in your word that we might be able to make wise decisions, especially in this election year, decisions that will honor and glorify you despite the fact that we have so many flawed candidates. Father, we pray that you'd guide and direct our thinking this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, we're going to begin approximately where I ended the last time. But as I said at the end of the previous uh, lesson, I want to go on and take what we learned from Matthew 22, 15 to 22, and to expand that in terms of a framework for understanding the role of the Christian in relation to civil government. It's important that we understand this uh, today as much as any time, but I think that in recent years we have seen the function of the government of the United States deteriorate. Uh, poll after poll demonstrates that the people have little faith in our uh, representatives, in Congress, in our president, that the direction of the country is not where it should be. And yet, election after election uh, in the last 20, 25 years seems to uh, not resolve any of these problems, but things get worse, and some of us think they're getting worse quicker than they were five or eight or ten years ago. So we need to think through what the Bible says about the believer and the believer's role in relation to government. Recently, I was um, going through files and cleaning things out, and I ran across an article... I'm not sure where it was originally published. Somebody gave it this to me. It was this article published in October 13th of 1975. And <clears throat> it is a review of a document that was uh, discovered in May of 1919. I don't think that's anybody here was alive at that point. In May of 1919, at Dusseldorf, Germany, the Allied uh, forces obtained a copy of the Communist Rules of Revolu Revolution. And <clears throat> if you listen to them, you will see how these rules have been implemented by certain political parties. Not everyone, I'm not painting everything with a broad stroke, but many of these have come through, especially in those who hold to the progressive uh, worldview that is dominating so much of both parties. A, there are, let me see here, I'll go through this. There's three major points, and B has several sub-points. So A is corrupt the young, get them away from religion, get them interested in sex, make them superficial, uh, destroy their ruggedness. I think we could all agree that has happened uh, more than we ever imagined. I remember the first time I heard this was long before 1975, and that is certainly true. We live in a, in a world where young people have become so uh, effeminized 
uh, due to several factors that we've lost our sense. We, we have young men who don't know what it means to be a man. We have middle-aged men who have forgotten what it means to be a man. We have been told that true manliness is somehow um, uh, it, it's somehow chauvinistic, and that's far from the truth. B, get control of all means of publicity, thereby, one, get the people's minds off their government by focusing their on attention on athletics, sexy books, and plays, and other trivialities. Two, divide the people into hostile groups by constantly harping on controversial matters of no importance. Three, destroy the people's faith in their natural leaders by holding the latter up to contempt, ridicule, and obloquy. Fourth, always preach true democracy, but seize power as fast as and as ruthlessly as possible. Fifth, by encouraging government extravagance, destroy its credit, produce fear of inflation with rising prices and general discontent. Sixth, foment unnecessary strikes in vital industries, encourage civil disorders, and foster lenient and soft attitude on the part of government towards such disorders. Seven, by specious argument, ca cause the breakdown of the old moral virtues, honesty, sobriety, confidence, faith in the pledged word, and ruggedness. C, cause the registration of all firearms on some pretext with a view towards confiscating them and leaving the population helpless. I think that's a pretty good uh, summary of a lot of values that we need to definitely eschew and work against because that is what destroys any civilization or culture from the inside out. Now last time we were focusing in this section in Matthew 22 which is part of a threefold uh, series of questions that the Sadducees, Pharisees, and other religious leaders bring to Jesus to attempt to um, uh, discredit him, uh, to discredit him among either anger the masses or to anger the Roman government. Somehow, if he falls into the trap, one or the other will go against him. This attempt failed. The question they were asking is, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And during this time, in fact, since about uh, uh, 6 AD under, uh, under Tiberius, there, there were and continue to be up until the destruction of the temple in AD 70 numerous uh, tax revolts against the Romans. It was a, a hot issue that uh, fomented a, a lot of reaction, hostile reaction, uh, among the Jews. So uh, if Jesus said, yes, pay the taxes, then he's going to anger the masses. If he says, no, it's a legal tax, then the Romans will go after him. So how is he going to answer this question? Now, last time I pointed out that Jesus in his answer says, show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. Denar a denarius was a Roman coin, and on that coin you had a picture of, in this case, and at this time, the emperor was Tiberius. And there is an inscription on the coin which makes a claim of deity for Tiberius. It's a claim of deity for the state. Now, the idea of the state claiming to be divine is nothing new. Uh, the Egyptians did it rather well. Uh, Mesopotamian empires and kings did it as well. This is not something that is foreign to a Jewish culture. They were in captivity in Egypt when the Pharaoh claimed to be the uh, incarnation of a god. They were uh, captives in Babylon when the Nebuchadnezzar had an idol constructed of himself to be worshipped by all the people. This idea of living under a government that claimed the authority of God for itself and to be sovereign over all things was not anything new for a Jewish, Jewish community. So this was not new, but this was the claim of, of Tiberius. Now, what is going on here is that 
as a Jesus and in, in his answer says to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now what he is saying is that there are spheres of authority that government is authority that is established by God, as we'll see, this is articulated numerous places in Scripture, that God himself instituted human government, despite the fact that that human government would be corrupted and would be under the control of uh, many who would abuse its authority. Nevertheless, God delegated authority to the human race. And so that there are, there is a hierarchy of authority in relation to God and government and other subordinate uh, authorities. However, there's also an argument out there that I've run across a few times that claims that that's not what is going on here at all. This is uh, actually Jesus pitting God against Caesar. Jesus isn't uh, in some way saying, well, the government has a certain sphere of authority and so you should pay your taxes. And but nevertheless, the government can't take over the role of God, and so you need to render to God that which is due God. He is in fact saying that that the state of Rome is claiming exclusive authority by divine right; that they are divine, and this is a hundred percent collision with God's claim to rule over everything. And that what Jesus was saying in a very in a very subtle way was you don't need to pay your taxes because this is based on a false claim of deity and therefore don't pay your taxes. Now there's a certain political view that, that wants to lean in that direction. But that's not what's going on here at all. Uh, the problem is that this is taking this passage out of a broader context of Scripture. And so we have to understand this. We have to look at what the Bible teaches about the authority that God has delegated to human civil government and how the believer is to relate to that authority. It's one thing to say that we should submit to an authority that is doing what we think they should do and is expecting or requiring of us what we think they should expect or require. But if they go beyond a certain point, then uh, we need to... Uh, rebel against them. So where does the line lie if we can even draw a line? So let's look at a few, pa few passages. Turn first of all to Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis, as we've studied in the past, there are five divine institutions laid out. God established these. In this organization, these five divine institutions, we see that each builds upon the previous one and that these were instituted by God for the stability and the preservation and the perpetuation of the human race. What we see in divine institution number one, and though it's been explained with slightly different terminology by different pastors, is an emphasis on personal or individual responsibility. That means every individual is ultimately responsible to God for the decisions that they make. This is uh, seen in the first prohibition that God established in the Garden of Eden where he said to Adam, of all the trees in the garden you may eat except for this one. The day that you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that day you will surely die. Now notice he didn't say that to Eve. Eve had not yet been created. He's given that to Adam and this is going to become Adam's responsibility that when God creates Eve, it's his responsibility as the head of the race and as the spiritual head to inform and instruct Eve on these, these realities, which is what took place. So the second divine institution is marriage. Marriage is designed for the perpetuation of the human race. It provides stability as, and it provides the proper and only framework for sexual relations. And even though the only purpose for sexual relations is not uh, the propagation of the species, it is to be enjoyed only within that framework of marriage. In marriage, there's an authority structure. The husband is the authority. 
So authority is, as we've studied in 1 Samuel, authority runs through every one of these divine institutions, and that's so important to understand because there are times, because of sin, that we all want to subvert the authority that is over us. That is part of sinfulness because the orientation of the sin nature is to self, uh, self-absorption and self-indulgence, and we want it to be all about us. Narcissism is uh, the, the domain of the sin nature. The marriage produces children. Now, even though Adam and Eve did not have children in the garden, the fact that they were commanded to be fruitful and multiply envisions the reality of children. And is and all three of these divine institutions are given before there's any sin. So even in perfect environment, God recognized that authority needed to function, so authority is not a bad thing, that authority needed to function for there to be order and for there to be organization and to be able to accomplish the goals and, and purposes that God had established for the human race. Now, we all know that Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God. Eve ate the fruit first. Adam ate the fruit second. And that plunged his action, not hers, plunged the human race into corruption. And it reverberated through all of creation so that all of creation became corrupted by the presence of sin and evil. Now, there were no established governing authorities in the period from Adam to Noah. The only authority was that which was inherent within the family. And there's a massive breakdown in society. There's the murder in the first uh, family of uh, between two brothers. Cain murders Abel. And then there are subsequent murderers. There's the development of uh, polygamy. All of this goes on so that by the time we come to Noah, uh, God, we're told uh, anthropomorphically or anthropopathically, is uh, disgusted with the human race, regrets that he created the human race because the thoughts of man's heart is, is continuously evil. He is in rebellion against God, and the only ones that find grace in the eyes of the Lord is Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And then God brings a judgment on the earth, wipes out all living things uh, that are that breathe the air except for those families and those that are preserved upon the ark coming off the ark the human race gets a second chance and god establishes a covenant with noah we're going to accomplish new rules there are things that are similar things that are different with the uh, original creation covenant but for our purposes what we're going to focus on is two verses these two verses establish a new system of authority that will be established. God, on basis of these verses, delegates to mankind the responsibility of self-government. Man is, for the first time, mandated to govern himself. And so this is what we see here. God, we have to remember, is omniscient. We have some people, we have Christians, we have non-Christians, we have a lot of folks who think, oh, we should not have capital punishment. Capital punishment is often abused. It is often someone who is not truly guilty is sentenced to uh, death. There have been those who have been unjustifiably and wrongly executed because of capital punishment, so we ought not have capital punishment. Well, guess what, folks? God, in his omniscience, knew that that would happen. Now, if that's a justification for not doing it, then why, didn't God, why did God go ahead and authorize it and mandate it? So the fact that man fails is not an excuse for not having capital punishment. Just because we have people who fail at marriage and they are unfaithful, or they have a divorce, does not mean that we should just scrap marriage. Just because parents are uh, failures at being parents and that the family unit does not function correctly, and sometimes it's just extremely uh, dysfunctional and even destructive at times to those that are within the, those evil families, does not mean that we should just do away with families. 
See, just because an institution is being um, implemented by sinful, fallen, corrupt human beings doesn't mean that we do away with it because the, 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 the uh, institution itself is established to preserve the human race and especially human government and nationalism, the, the fifth, fourth, and fifth divine institutions are given to help restrain the sinfulness of mankind. And this is what we see, that God created the governing authorities for the purpose of to, that they are ministers of righteousness in Romans 13 in the New Testament. But what we see here in Genesis chapter 9 is the foundation for human government. God has delegated this human, human government. His, uh, the original government was divine, and that was the rule of God. So in principle, government is not flawed. Now, the reason I'm making that point is I have heard people, uh, solid believers who spend a lot of time under solid teaching, make the point that, well, government is always evil. No, the people in government are evil, but government as a principle begins with God, and government as a principle is in and of itself not evil. So we have the uh, delegation of certain government um, responsibilities here for the first time, and we look at this covenant, and one question we should ask is, how long does this covenant last? Well, the covenant lasts until God destroys the present heavens and the present earth. And that will not be until the end of the millennium. Uh, the, the Noahic covenant is a perpetual covenant, so it is still in effect. And the sign of that covenant is the rainbow. So any time that we look outside and see a rainbow, and who knows, we may see one today or tomorrow or the next day, and this will remind you that this covenant with Noah is still in effect. That means the provisions to eat meat are still in effect. That means the provisions to uh, take a life under certain circumstances is also uh, in effect. And it means that God's promise that he will not destroy the earth by water again is also in effect. The way we've been getting rain here the last, uh, this last year, some people need to be reminded that God will not destroy mankind, may destroy a few villages and cities and small towns along the way, but not the whole earth. But there will be an ultimate, ultimate destruction. Now what we see in verses 5 and 6 is a foundation for why Christians and why the Judeo-Christian heritage emphasizes the sanctity of human life and that the role of government ultimately, and according to the Noahic Covenant, is to preserve and to protect human life. Thus, when a life is taken unjustly, there is to be a judicial framework for evaluating what happened and determining guilt as well as punishment. So the most extreme form of punishment, the most serious form of punishment is taking the life of a human being, and that is what is authorized here. And notice the text does not say that it is designed to prevent other people from doing it. You often have those who are against uh, the death penalty saying, well, studies show that it doesn't prevent anything. And others say, say, yes, it does. Well, prevention isn't part of the covenant. Don't get caught in that trap. The covenant says that the reason, look at verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Why? For in the image of God he made man. Now that's important. The image of God, it belongs to every single human being. Genesis 1, 26 to 27, God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, over all the earth, and creeping things that creep on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created them. So it's image bearers, men and women, we are, the, from Adam and Eve down, even though the image is corrupted and flawed, we're still in the image of God. We are to represent God. That's what an image does. It represents God. So when you take the life of another person, what you are doing is, in effect, making a theological statement that you are attacking God. 
indirectly through his image, through his representative. So murder, and we're not talking about um, killing as a form of capital punishment because obviously God authorizes that. Sometimes you'll hear people say, uh, quote the uh, commandment in Exodus 20 verse 13, you shall not murder. In the King James, it was translated, you shall not kill. People will trans quote that and say, see, don't, don't kill. And the fact is that there's about seven different words in the Old Testament in Hebrew to describe killing. This is the word ratzach, which means to murder. In fact, in Exodus chapter 21, there's a clear, another clear statement about capital punishment and stipulations that under certain conditions the life of someone who commits murder is to be taken. There are numerous places in the Old Testament that authorize uh, capital punishment. So capital punishment isn't ratzach. What is prohibited here is ratzach. Taking life in combat, self-defense, is not Ratzach, that is not prohibited. Taking a life in self-defense is authorized. Taking a life in combat as part of war is also authorized. So we have to be careful to understand what the text actually says. So as we move from the covenant with Noah and we look at the covenant with Moses, we see that there's a structure at the beginning of the Mosaic Law, which we usually refer to as the Ten Commandments. Uh, sometimes it's used, a more technical term is the Decalogue, which is the Ten Sayings. But we have the Ten Commandments, and they're divided into t basically two, two subject categories. Uh, the first category relates to how we relate to God. The second relates to how we relate to mankind. Uh, Jesus summarized the commandments, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first part of the Ten Commandments. And the second part is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now that is often abused by certain people who have a false sense of compassion. Uh, for example, I was informed yesterday uh, by one of the men at our men's prayer breakfast that he was in a conversation with someone and the Ten Commandments came up and uh, he asked him, well, what are, the, what are the greatest commandments? And the other person said, you shall love the, uh, your neighbor as yourself and said, this is why we need to let uh, as many uh, refugees and people come across the border as possible. Uh, not letting them come is not loving our neighbor. And... Um, I thought about that. I said, that's typical progressivism that focuses on the wrong person as the neighbor. What about your actual neighbor who is killed by someone who is here illegally? What about your uh, co-worker's children who become addicted to drugs because of the uh, drug activity that comes across uh, the border due to this illegal immigra immigrant activity? Uh, those are your neighbors also. Uh, but typical in progressivism, when you see somebody who's committed murder, you'll hear the liberals come out and they will be against capital punishment because they, they're focusing on the cr criminal and you're going to love your neighbor, that is the criminal, and they forget about the victim of the crime who is also their neighbor. It is a selective and wrong application of the principle. But the second part of the Decalogue focuses on how man relates to man under the principle of loving your neighbor as yourself. You shall not murder. And this emphasizes the sanctity of life again, that it is the role of government to protect and provide security for people. And this is instantiated in this, this commandment. Second commandment is protection of the second and third divine institutions. You shall not commit adultery. And that is to preserve marriage within and sexual relations within the framework uh, of marriage and to protect marriage so that it becomes the, the, the focal point of providing education and stability within a nation. When this divine institution begins to fall apart, and if you had noticed, it is in this nation, we have a lower divorce rate now, but that's not because... Fewer people are getting divorced, it's because fewer people are getting married. 
They're just living together. And they'll live together for a while, and then they won't. That's not the divine institution of marriage. Marriage is the, the focal point of stability for any culture. Once you change the meaning of marriage and begin to allow uh, people of the same sex to, to marry, then you are destroying the, the concept of, of marriage and you will destroy your nation. Uh, we already have cases that are coming up through the court systems related to uh, validating and legalizing um, polygamy. Because we're going to change the definition of marriage from one man and one woman, why not two men and four women? Why not one man and eight women or one woman and eight men? Uh, once you start making the definition of the divine institutions the prerogative of human government, then you will destroy the nation and its days are numbered. Uh, you shall not steal. This protects private property. It's a recognition that people have the right to own things without it being uh, taken from them by others. And so it emphasizes the sanctity of private property. And it's, it's interesting that in this, uh, in this command, you shall not steal, there's no object. It doesn't say you shall not steal pri uh, property. It doesn't say you shall not steal cars. It doesn't say you shall not steal uh, money. It says you shall not steal, period. Uh, so there's a, an unstated object that implies that theft of any kind is also wrong. Then there is the next commandment, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And this pr protects uh, the pr uh, privacy, it protects the reputation of the neighbor. You can't steal his reputation, you can't steal his integrity. Uh, this is to protect the neighbor's good name and reputation, and um, also you can't falsely imprison him or falsely punish him, protecting him from, from those kinds of attacks. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross because uh, the Jewish leaders, the governing powers over the Jews, bore false witness against him. They made claims that were, that were untrue. The last commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. This is the focus. This is what convict, one of the things that convicted the Apostle Paul. It's a recognition of a mental attitude sin, that you can avoid certain overt sins, but the mental attitude sins of, of lust are, are just as sinful. This last commandment highlights, highlights this and emphasizes that uh, mental attitude sins of lust are also self-destructive, and it destroys one's own personal integrity. So we see an authorization of government of power to uh, oversee these things and to uh, emphasize them in a, in a government. Now the Mosaic Law was designed for the Jewish people and it's not, was not intended to be tr uh, transferred in total in toto to another, um, to another country, but it provides a pattern. And it, it, this is such in our uh, system of jurisprudence, which has its roots in English common law. This goes back to one of the greatest uh, Anglo-Saxon kings, Alfred the Great, who was quite a biblical scholar. In fact, he translated the, uh, many of the Psalms into Hebrew, and he composed a fine legal document uh, referred to as the dooms of, of, of uh, Alfred the Great, and in Old uh, Saxon, a doom was a law. So this is the laws of Alfred the Great, and this provides the foundation for, uh, for the development of, of common law, I mean, excuse, uh, of law in England. So it's the Old Testament establishes and legitimizes human government as delegated by God, even though there would be kings and emperors that would be corrupt and would significantly abuse that authority and also set themselves up to be worshipped as God. Nevertheless, as we see, if we were to take the time to look at Daniel 2, Daniel 4, Daniel 5, we would see that here we see an example of believers who are living in a corrupt pagan government 
who recognize the need to still function under the authority of that government. And when they are challenged, they, for example, uh, negotiated in Daniel 1, and God gave them wisdom. And in that case, they were successful. In Daniel chapter 3, the command to worship the idol of Nebuchadnezzar, they were unable to negotiate a compromise, and so they were willing to die uh, in order to uh, stay true to their faith, but they were not going to rebel against the king. Uh, and Daniel chapter 5, Daniel goes to the lion's den. Even though there's an unjust law, he's just quietly does what he knows to be the correct thing to do, even though he knows that he will be sent to the lion's den, and he just trusts God to take care of what needs to be taken care of. When we get into the New Testament, Jesus also gives some instruction about human government and also provides an example of dealing with human government. Uh, some of this is explicit in the form of direct statements and other is implicit in his attitude and relation to governing authorities. He taught and he demonstrated submission to government. Even when he is brought up on unjust charges based on false witnesses before a tyrannical government represented by Pontius Pilate, he submits to their decision. In fact, the irony is that if Jesus had not submitted to an unjust, tyrannical authority, we would not have salvation. Now that's something to ponder, because there are many of us who say, I'm not going to obey a tyrannical government. Think about it. So Jesus comes along in John chapter 19, 11, he recognizes the authority of Rome, and he says to Pilate, you could, not, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. He's recognizing that the authority of human government is delegated under the authority of God. It's not a, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive um, claims. That, see, that, that was the argument that I read uh, against uh, uh, the interpretation of the render under Caesar, that which is Caesar's and under God, which is God's, is he setting these up as mutually exclusive domains, and therefore he's saying you either obey human government or you obey God. That's his bottom line. That was the uh, crux of that argument. But Jesus is showing that there's a hierarchy here, that even corrupt govern governors rule under the authority of God, and God delegates that, uh, that power. Another example, we see people going to Jesus to adjudicate civil cases. He refuses to do it. In one case, in Luke chapter 12, someone in the crowd says, uh, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So here we have a dispute between siblings over the distribution of the inheritance and the property. And Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Jesus doesn't step over the line and take on civil authority. He says to him, though, in verse 15, take heed and beware of covetousness. Jesus addresses the core spiritual issue that whatever else is going on here, make sure that you are not being ruled by sin, by the Tenth Commandment. Avoid that. Uh, beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of of the things he possesses. In another passage that we have studied in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus also authorized the payment of taxes. We read in verse 24, when they had come to Capernaum, that's the disciples, and here it's specifically Peter and Jesus, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? You know, they're questioning Jesus' legitimacy, trying to trap him on this. And Peter's response was yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus anticipated what he would say and said, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? Now, I want you to notice how he frames the question. He doesn't say, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the priests take customs or taxes. The question he's asking isn't narrowed to the temple tax. He talks about kings of the earth. 
He's relating this to all taxes. And in the payment of the temple tax, remember the temple is under the authority of the Sanhedrin, and it is being ruled by a very corrupt religious system. Under the high priest family of Annas, of whom Caiaphas is a son-in-law, uh, the priesthood was extremely corrupt, and the family of Annas was kind of like the fa family of Don Corleone. They are corrupt through and through. It was, it was a criminal operation. And Jesus could say, which some people would want him to say today, well, don't pay the taxes because you're paying into a corrupt system. So it's fine for you not to pay the taxes. But that's not what he says. He says, well, uh, Peter answers and says, well, it's from strangers. Jesus said, then the sons are free. And, and what Jesus is making point is, well, maybe there's a case there for us not paying it, but we're going to do it anyway because it's the right thing. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, take up a fish, and you'll take a, uh, a didrachma, a piece of money out of his, that was for the payment of the tax, and then go and give it to them for you and me. Jesus doesn't challenge the right of paying taxes. But Jesus wasn't uncritical of governing authorities. He teaches the, 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 that we are to obey authority, but he's also critical of the way the authority is exercised. Luke 22, 25, he recognizes that the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship in an arrogant, tyrannical manner. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. It's totally false. It's doublespeak, like Orwell's 1984. Mark 8.15, he challenges the Pharisees. He says, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. He, does not, he, he realizes they are illegitimately practicing their authority. Nevertheless, you still pay the temple tax. Matthew 23, 3 and 4. Um, there's a further indictment of the religious leaders. We'll get to this in, our, in the next chapter in Matthew, the, the, the woes against the religious leaders. He said, therefore, whatever they, that is the Pharisees, tell you to observe, that observe and do, but don't do it according to their works, for they say and do not do. And they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. He's indicting them for the uh, egregious and horrible use of their authority and the wrong use of their authority that it's unrighteous but he says still do what they say Romans 13 two other passages the New Testament will hit briefly I mentioned this last time in Romans chapter 13 verse 6 Paul says for because of this you also pay taxes See, he's not, he, if, if he says pay taxes and Jesus really meant don't pay taxes to an illegitimate authority, then you'd have a problem. But the Bible's consistent. Pay taxes for they are God's ministers, attending continually this, this very thing. Now, he's writing under the early part of Nero's reign. But nevertheless, Rome is still a corrupt, tyrannical empire. And he says, pay your taxes. Render, therefore, to all their due taxes, to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And in, he began this discussion, Romans 13, 1 and 2, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that are exist are appointed by God. In other words, what he is saying is that, that even if human beings are abusing that authority, the delegation of it is still from God, and therefore we are to serve the government, obey the government as unto the Lord. That's what Peter's argument will be in 1 Peter 2. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of, of man for the Lord's sake. We see the extent of obedience is to every ordinance. The motivation is because we're serving the Lord. That's the same thing. That, that wives are su to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. Every time we submit to authority, we do it as unto the Lord, because as we studied in Samuel a few weeks ago, when Samuel indicts Saul for his disobedience, he says to him that, that rebellion is like the sin of divination, and insubordination is like the sin of idolatry and sin. 
it's wrong inherently because this reflects the first sin of the universe, Satan's rebellion against God. So Peter goes on to say we're to obey the king as supreme and governors and those sent by him uh, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Remember, Peter writes under the latter part of Nero's reign when Nero was out of control and crazy and persecuting Christians. And he still says, submit to the authority of government. Why? Verse 15, for this is the will of God that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And he'll go on to talk about the fact that it's, when you do good, you may get punished, but it's better to be punished for doing good than being punished for not doing good. Because if you get punished for not doing good, you deserve it. But when there's punishment for doing good, then that counts for eternity if it's under the filling of the Spirit. But that Peter, the same Peter who wrote this, is the Peter who recognized that there were times when you did not obey government. When the Sanhedrin ordered Peter and John to not preach the gospel, Peter and John said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. There are times when any authority over us tells us to do something in direct opposition to what the Word of God says. Then we are authorized to disobey. Not just some principle, but when there's a direct statement of Scripture, don't do this, and the government says to do it, then we're authorized to disobey. Or if the government says, don't do this, and, or, or do this, and, this and, and God says, don't do it, then we are to always obey God. One last thought this morning. As we all wrestle with issues related to the election, whether it's national office, state office, local office. In the past, I encourage you to go back and think through the series I, I taught in 2008 on decision-making in the voting booth. The principles are still very much valid. But there's another principle that uh, I think is, should be added to that. We are exhorted to pray for leaders in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Paul writes, Again, this is during the time of Nero. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. That would include Nero. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. I think one criterion in determining who we elect for mayor, who we elect for governor, who we elect for any office, is are they going to have an administration that is inclined to making it, to increasing our freedom as Christians to function freely in the marketplace of ideas? Or are they going to be hostile? Are they going to pass laws and ordinances that make it a distraction and a challenge? We had a mayor in Houston that was elected. She had an agenda, uh, and she was anti-church in many of her things that she tried to pass. And it took a lot of time and energy and money and effort by Christian leaders to fight her agenda. She should never have been elected. Christians should never have voted for her on this principle alone. That she's going to have an administration that will try to put forth laws and ordinances and also will appoint people who would be hostile to the practice in the marketplace of biblical Christianity. And that should be applied across the board. That is another principle that we should take into account as we're evaluating candidates and the people for whom we are to vote. But ultimately, ultimately, we recognize that there is an authority in the universe. That authority is God, and he has directed us in his word, and that he has delegated authority through the state in order to provide security and stability for a nation. But when these principles are violated, it doesn't justify us in going out in some kind of rebellion, but it will lead to the destruction of a state. The only hope for this country is Jesus Christ. There can be moral shifts, there can be some political party shifts, but unless there's an internal heart attitude, a shift of thinking in the soul, that moves the culture back to submission to God and to his word, 
there will be no restoration at all, and we will just continue on the path to destruction. But as believers living in that environment, we can have great joy and stability because of our relation to the Lord and the doctrine that's in our soul, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things, to reflect on what you've taught about authority and government and the scripture, that we may come to understand that, yes, authority is, uh, or government is real and legitimate, but there are those who may corrupt it. Nevertheless, we have a responsibility to be obedient and to glorify you through that obedience. Father, we recognize the only solution to all the problems in life or any problem we have is ultimately our relationship to Jesus Christ, that you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins, and that the greatest, great solution for us is to begin with trusting in him as our Savior, because there is no real life for us apart from Jesus Christ. He is the way, and he is the life. And Father, we pray that anyone listening to this message would take this opportunity to trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior who died for their sins if they have never done that before. And Father, for us as believers, we need to be reminded that that citizenship in this world, especially under the Constitution of our nation, involves responsibility, civil responsibilities related to obedience to the government and also involvement in governing process. That is part of good civics and good civil responsibility. And Father, we pray for our nation that there might be a change, that you would continue to raise up uh, men of God who will proclaim the truth of your word and people who would respond to that truth and that once again we could see your word implemented in the lives of people in this country. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.